So it's not wrong to celebrate your birthday, is it? No, of course not. And so we don't ever want to take the scriptures out of its context because when you do, and so often, it steals the joy that is ours in understanding the word of God. The joy of our salvation, right? is the salvation that Jesus Christ brought into our life as we understand his grace and his mercy and his love for us. You do know and you do recognize that Jesus Christ loves you far more than you will ever love him. You understand that? He's far more committed to you than you will ever be to him. Is that not true? Isn't that a joy? Wow. I am loved that much. And oh, by the way, how many of you really do want to go to heaven? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right. Well, listen to me. Here's another truth that you need to rejoice in this morning. He wants you there with him more than you want to be there. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And in John 17, we learn that Jesus has kept us. And that one word for kept in verse 12 was that he, he kept us from escaping from his love. His happiness, his joy, his life, his light. Oh, isn't that wonderful? We're so well kept. But this morning, I just want to, that last verse in chapter 17, verse 26, read that with me. Jesus is saying, and I have declared to them. Who are the them? The disciple. Oh, you're, are you reading that with me aloud? Is that what you want to do? All right, stand up and read it with me. Okay. <laughs> it's your service. It's not mine. <laughs> stand up. Let's read verse 26 together. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Lord, as we read this once again, it puts a smile in our heart, Lord, that the love that the Father has for you, Jesus, is the same love that you place within us. We thank you, Father God, and may that love be demonstrated each and every day as we go about living in this life right now, living your life, not our own, in your holy and precious name, amen. You may be seated. Yeah, all right. So that's what I wanted to talk about, particularly the last part of the verse, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, uh, we've been talking about a fellow on Wednesday nights who kind of just disappeared. What was his name? Enoch, Enoch. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 5 for a minute. Let's look at the life of Enoch for a moment. This is a uh, fantastic study in the genealogy alone in chapter 5. I don't know how many of you have done that, but in the meaning of the names of the people, the men who were born, is the gospel message. I don't know if you've ever studied that. And I don't have time for that this morning, but uh, maybe another time. But you should do that on your own. Take a look at that, but it's fascinating. But nonetheless, we want to look at verse 21 of chapter 5 of Genesis. Verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Methuselah was his son, right? What's distinctive about Methuselah? He was the oldest man that ever lived. He lived to 969 years old. Genesis chapter 5, look at verse 21. Methuselah was birthed by Enoch. Methuselah was the oldest man that ever lived, 969 years, yet he died before his father. Right? I love telling people that. They look at me, what is he talking about? Well, we know what happened. Look, look at the text. After he begot Methuselah, he got a prayer life. How many parents are here today? Isn't that true? You birth children, you get a prayer life. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> yeah, children will make you a praying people. After he begot Methuselah, he walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. And so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Methuselah was how old? 969 years. He's only 365 years. But what happened? And Enoch walked with God and was no more. He was not, for God took him. Now, I like to refer to this as the vanishing point. Enoch reached the vanishing point in his life. He walked with God so closely, continually, daily, that one day Enoch was no more. The dictionary definition of the vanishing point is a point of disappearance, a cessation, no longer cease to exist. That's what happened to Enoch. 
Hebrews chapter 11, you don't need to turn there, but Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that by faith Enoch believed God. He walked with God and he pleased God. And because he had pleased God, God rewarded him and he had been taken away. No more. Now, I know contextually Enoch is a type of what in the Old Testament? The rapture. The rapture, the rapture of the church. Enoch escaped what? Yeah, what, what did he, the flood. Somebody said it. Enoch escaped the flood. Immediately after Enoch was taken, shortly after that, uh, God instructed Noah to build an ark. Why? Because God was going to flood the earth. And Noah was faithful. It had never rained. The water, can, water vapor canopy that surrounded the earth had never broken before. And that's what was about to take place. That, that water vapor barrier that surrounded the earth that created the whole world was like a garden paradise. The firmament in the heavens. And so God was preparing Noah and his family for what was about to take place. But Enoch was spared the tribulation of that day. Wow. You are looking forward to going, aren't you? Oh, a glorious day that'll be. What day might that be? September 25th through the 27th. What's going on then? Yom Torah, the, the Feast of Trumpets. And, and I don't know how much you've studied the Feasts of Israel, how much you've studied eschatology, and particularly end times, and particularly the rapture of the church, but there's a great correlation between Yom Torah, the Feast of Trumpets, and the rapture of the church. <coughs> Hebrews tells us that Enoch was rewarded by being taken because he walked so closely with God and because he was so close to God and God was so in Enoch, he was no more. Now, I know technically what the text tells us, that Enoch was one of the few who did not die. He did not see death. Who else did not see death? Elijah. Elijah did not see death. Who else is not going to see death? Hopefully us. Maybe we might be that generation. Who knows? You know, this song keeps ringing in my ears. It's not that song. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a trumpet, man. <laughs> you know that song, See You in September? Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this September. Yeah. Enoch. But Enoch walked with God so closely, so intimately, that Enoch could not be seen anymore. You know, that's what God really desires for every one of us. If you go to John chapter 3, you know, we have the record of Jesus and his cousin. Who was his cousin? John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And we talked about the uh, need for the new birth there as he's speaking. But then we talk about John and John's exaltation of his cousin, Jesus, right? And it's fascinating that just, just in the... In the, in the history of John himself, there's the gospel message as well, not just the lineage of those men in Genesis chapter 5, but when we have the record of John the Baptist, we know that his father's name was Zacharias. He was a very old man. He was a priest in Israel, and he was married to a woman named Elizabeth, and they had no children, and they prayed, and God put fruit in the womb, didn't he? And he foretold what was going to take place to Zechariah as he was ministering in the temple at the altar of incense. And Zechariah means God remembers. And Elizabeth means his covenant or his oath. And John, you'll call him John, means, wow, just in the names of those three people. God remembers his covenant to be gracious, and he's the forerunner because <laughs> comes the Savior, Jesus. Isn't that amazing? But look what John said in chapter 3 and verse 30. Read that aloud with me. In verse 30, it says, He must increase, I must decrease. Who's speaking? John the Baptist. Now, John was the last prophet. And Jesus said of John, of those born of women, there's no man greater. No man who has ever been born, ever walked the face of it, was greater than the apostle John, or than the prophet John. And John was the forerunner of Jesus Christ, the Savior to come. 
But he said to his followers, and he had many disciples as he was baptizing them, a baptism unto repentance. Why was John calling them to a baptism of repentance? Preparing their hearts and their lives for the coming of the Savior. Did Jesus need to be baptized? No. But so that all righteousness would be fulfilled, Jesus submitted to the baptism of John, but there was no need for repentance in Jesus' life. But there's need for repentance in our life, isn't there? Jesus told us in John's gospel that the Holy Spirit has come, that Jesus himself has sent the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. He's not an it. He's a person. He sent him into the world to convince the world of what? Sin. Sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Is that true? Everyone has sinned. And when you go witnessing to people, don't let them get you sidetracked on some other issue, you know, whether it's the abortion issue, whether it's the gender dysphoria of today, whether all the, all the craziness. Stay focused on the fact that, first of all, you need to be used of the Holy Spirit to convince them of what? Sin first. For all have sinned. And you know what I, you know, like I, I like to use the way of the master, where you're first take, ask them, do you believe in God? Do you believe God exists? Yeah, do you know the Ten Commandments? And most people in the United States can tell you there's Ten Commandments, and they may be, may be able to recite a handful of them. And then you go down the list. Have you ever done this or this or this and this and this? Okay, well, there's God's law. And if God was judging you according to the law, you in or out? You're out. But God, God has made a way to resolve the problem, to allow you to come in through the righteousness of sin and of righteousness. Whose righteousness? The righteousness of Christ alone. For we have to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ in order to enter heaven. You've got to have the wedding garment on. No wedding garment, no wedding feast, right? Of righteousness and then of the judgment to come. Oh, isn't it glorious? The judgment of sin. Aren't you glad that there's a judgment on sin? You're not sure, are you? Well, there is a judgment of sin. Now, either the judgment of sin had taken place at the cross or or every individual will be judged for their sin. That's, That's the choice we have. There's only two possibilities. Either you will suffer the consequence of your sin and the eternal judgment that would come or or Jesus Christ himself has taken upon himself the judgment for our sin. Isn't that wonderful? And so John understood. He said, I must decrease, he must increase. Is that true about your life? I love the, one of the songs in the worship set. I love them all, but I love one of the songs in the worship set where it talks about it's not about me, it's all about... Is that true? You know, the personality cults that that exist today in in Christianity in the church, it's terrible. It's terrible that, that men would allow so much glory honor be given unto them rather than to the Lord. Amazing. In Luke 17, and you don't need to turn there, Jesus' own words, he says, whoever seeks to save his life will, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it, preserve it, find it. Now, listen, you got to understand that exchange life policy. If you're trying to only live your own life, the life you want to live according to your will, what's going to happen? You lose your soul. But if you choose to surrender your life and to lose your life in Christ, then you find eternal life. John eleven twenty six. 26, what does it say? For all those who live in and believe in Jesus will have eternal life. Now, we, we like the belief part, okay? But it's got to be far more than intellectual. It's got to be far more than just a head knowledge. It's got to be a heart knowledge, right? A... a, a ounce of heart knowledge is equal to a ton of head knowledge. You understand? Because you're not only believing in intellectually, but you're living in Jesus in your heart. That's what's most important. Is that not true? Yeah. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, you all know this one. Paul writes and he says, if any man be in Christ, or woman, anyone be in Christ, what? They are a new creation. And what has happened? Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now, now listen to me. How often have I told you, beloved, 
And if you're new to our fellowship, uh, I, I'm the Papa. This is my family. These are my children. I love you so much. And I want to see God's life, Christ's life, worked in you more than ever before. And I don't want you to be hoodwinked. So I'm telling you all the time, listen with your... Don't listen with your ears. Why? What will happen? You become deceived. There are many deceivers out there, many pretenders, you know. Many who are just Christian in name only. They have something in their head, but nothing in their heart for the Lord. And so if you listen with your eyes, if you watch a person's life, they're going to live what they believe. And you'll see who they truly are. Is that not true? Yeah. As I've said so many times before, just show, show me your, your, your calendar, your day timer, your schedule. Show me your check register, and I'll tell you who your God is, where you spend your time and where you spend your resources. Isn't that true? Of course it's true. Of course it's true. But if any man, any woman, be in Christ, is a new creation. Turn with me to Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. Enoch walked with God and was no more. But we don't know much about the life of Enoch. But who wrote Philippians? Paul. Paul wrote Philippians and, and at, at least 12 other books of the New Testament. I think 13. I think Paul wrote 14 books in all of the New Testament. And I don't believe there's a better example in all the world of an individual whose life was lost in Christ, who gave up everything for the cause of Christ. Look what he writes here in chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Yet indeed I count all things as loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. What did Paul lose? What are some of the things that he lost because he was a follower of Christ? His family. Now, Paul was a member of the, the, the Pharisees, and so in order to be a Pharisee, you had to be married and you had to have children, so you experienced that part of life that you could share with others. Pharisees were, were like the, uh, the local pastors in the villages and the towns, and they would represent God to the people, the people of God. But in order to properly be able to minister unto the people who were married and have children, you needed to experience the same. Paul was married. Paul, in all probability, he had children, and when he became a Christian, they would considered him dead. He lost his family, his wife, his children. What else did he lose? I'm sorry? His position of promise, absolutely. Paul, Paul was going to be a mover and shaker in Israel. He was a high pot. You know, I mean, Gamaliel, the principal rabbon of Israel, was teaching Paul, instructing Paul. And they said, I, I can't keep enough manuscripts in this man's hand. He devours everything I give him. Wow. And Paul forsook all of that. Reputation, future, treasure. His inheritance was gone now. His father was a wealthy man from where? Tarsus. Tarsus. Wealthy businessman. Paul would have lost everything, his reputation, his wealth, his future, for the purpose of serving and surrendering his life to Jesus. Now, that doesn't cost us that, does it? Not today. Uh, for the first time in the history of the United States... The society is very hostile towards what we believe. And make no mistake about it, as far as the enemy is concerned, and the enemy is the chief conspirator working through all these institutions, the number one enemy is the church. Christianity, true church. The number two enemy is Israel, the Jew. Make no mistake about that. But Paul writes in verse 9, he says, that I may be found in him, in Jesus, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness by which, which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul said there's only thing, two things I purpose to know. The power of the resurrection in my life. Living the new life. If any man be in Christ, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Right? I told you, uh, we, we talked about it on Resurrection Sunday. Every, every believer experiences two resurrections. What's the first resurrection? Was anybody here? 
Resurrection Sunday. It was the spiritual resurrection of the man. Your, your spirit was dead to God. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely... And so it did. They died. How did they die? They didn't die physically, did they? Adam and Eve were still alive. They had children after that. But how did they die? They died spiritually. And therefore, all of their prodigy, all of their children were descendants of Adam. We all are dead spiritually when we come into this world. But we have to be made alive. There has to be a resurrection of our spirit to Christ. And then if you have experienced the resurrection of the spirit, you are guaranteed what? The resurrection of the body one day. Yeah. You know, this body, one day it's going to fall away. Thank God. <laughs> I had POD this morning. I suffer from POD. What's POD? Pain of the day. <laughs> As you get older, you know, that's what happened. <laughs> and so you gladly give up this body for the new one that's coming. And that's what Paul was talking about here, that I may experience the power of the resurrection. And the fellow, it only comes through the fellowship of what? Suffering. And what suffering would he be talking about? Dying, Dying to self. Thank you, my dear. That's the very suffering he's talking about, that we as Christians, if you truly are understanding the message of Christ, you die to that self-will. You die to all of those desires that you have, that you want, and you have to surrender and submit and say, God, what is your will for my life? What is it that you desire? Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians, the most Christ-centric book in the Bible, really, where Christ is considered the what? The prototokos in the Greek, the bekor in the Hebrew, the chief, preeminent one, number one, numeral uno, right? Yeah. Colossians chapter 3. Let's just look at uh, the first four verses of chapter 3. Colossians. What a beautiful sound. You're turning the pages of your Bible. You actually carry your Bible to church. Isn't that an amazing thing? If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you, did you? Did you? For you died. When did I die? When I became born again. Now my baptism displayed my identification with the death of Christ upon the cross. And my raising up from the water identified with the resurrection of Jesus Christ that all things have risen new in my life. But I died. You died. Did you? What ways are you manifesting that death? For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that you're safe. Listen, Moses safely tucked away in the cleft of the rock, right? Who is the rock? Who is that Ebenezer, that rock of help that is ours? You know, you know the word Ebenezer means rock of help. Who is our rock? And we are hidden in Christ, hidden in God, in Christ Jesus, safely tucked away because of our relationship with the Lord. Hmm? Yes, and when Christ, who is our what? Is he? Now, now listen, I, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm trying to touch your heart this morning. Those people that know you most intimately, would they really say that Christ is your life? Or is it just something you do on a Sunday morning for an hour, a couple times a month? Is that a holy hush? It's important, listen to me, beloved. It's important that we examine our lives. I need to die to self more and more. And 40 years I've been walking with the Lord and there's still a lot of me that's got to be killed off. And I know you'd like to help the Lord, but don't. <laughs> He'll do it. <laughs> but Christ who is our life, is he? When Christ who is our life appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So, Enoch found that God was his life. His joy was to just continually, daily, in a continuous basis, walk with God. Acknowledge God in his presence and just wanted everything that God wanted. He and God became so one. And then it tells us in Hebrews 11, God rewarded him. And in what way did he reward him? He was no more. He was living a life that displayed God to everyone around him. Mm. 
I want to I want to just develop this a little bit more. This vanishing point that each of us need to reach. And that's, listen, that's the goal. The goal of the Christian is to reach the point to where all people see is Jesus and they don't see you anymore. If somebody calls you a Jesus freak, is that good or bad? It's good. It's good, isn't it? Now, if they call you a Jesus freak, all they're saying is that you love Jesus more than they do and they don't like it. <laughs> That's okay, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Go with me to Romans chapter 12. And we're going to park it here as we look at what does it mean to reach the vanishing point? How do I do that? How do I accomplish what Jesus said and prayed for in John 17? That the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. How is that going to take place? Well, precisely following the instruction that the Apostle Paul gives us in Romans 12, the one man who displayed living in Christ or allowing Christ to live his life through him more than any other, when, when you met Paul, you didn't meet anybody but Jesus. When, when Paul spoke, he spoke the words of God. Paul lived, eat, and breathed Jesus. And so should we. What happens over time, unfortunately, you know, and, and you're so excited when you first get saved, aren't you? When you first get saved, you want to tell the whole world about Jesus. You, there's such a passion in you, such a fervor, such a fire. You're, I mean, you're boiling hot for the Lord, you know? And then over time, things seem to cool off a little bit. And then the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Make no mistake, we are a rich nation, and we are rich people. You, you may not be as rich as Elon Musk, but you are rich compared to the rest. So two-thirds of the world lives on how much a day? Two dollars. Two dollars. Over half the world's population do not have running water. You're rich. We are so rich. But, but the deceitfulness of those riches that allurement will cause us to be lukewarm, be cooled off in our fervency for God. Jesus explained that there was a church that he was speaking to that would occur in the last days, that would be apostate, it would be lukewarm. He said, I wish that you were hot or that you were cold, but you're lukewarm, so I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Ooh. Now, you don't want everyone God to say that to you, do you? What did he mean when he said, I wish that you were hot? Therapeutic. therapeutic. You know, hot water, right? Hot water is very therapeutic, isn't it? When you get POD, boy, there's nothing like an Epsom salts bath. You know what I mean? Uh, sorry for the mental image. But, but there's nothing, nothing like getting in a hot tub, Epsom salts, and let that water, oh, it takes all of the pain out of you, doesn't it? Get all that magnesium in there, relaxes the muscles. Therapeutic, hot. What about cold? Refreshing. Oh, man, you know, we had the heat index and the warnings all this week. And two days, I was working outside all day, both those days. Man, I'm telling you, it was hot. And I, and I would go in, and I have a, I have a place where I, I bathe my dog. It's a bathing station for the dog under the house. And, and I got a, a shower spray there. And I just went in there, and I just burned my head. And my, oh, as cold as I could get it. Oh, it was so refreshing cool off this hothead, you know. <laughs> and that's what he's talking about. Hey, as, as believers, when the rest of the world, when our family, when the closest to us experience us, it should be therapeutic. It should be refreshing. The therapeutic aspect is it's healing. The, the refreshing aspect is that we're inspiring, encouraging. Hmm. Here in chapter 12, Paul says, I beseech you, I beg you, I implore you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves, your bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, Paul is saying, I I'm begging you, each of you, to really consider that you really need to offer yourself to God completely. Living sacrifice. What kind of a sacrifice is he asking us to be? A holy what was, the, what was the sacrifice of Jesus? The, the sacrifice of Jesus. What do we call that? The Old Testament equivalent. The, in the sacrificial system of Leviticus. Come on, put your thinking cap on. In the sacrificial system of Leviticus, the, the equivalent of the 
offering of Christ or the sacrifice of Christ is which sacrifice? The Holocaust, the burnt offering. The burnt offering was the only offering in the Levitical system where the entire animal to be sacrificed was consumed on the altar, was burnt in sacrifice to God, in worship of God. It was called a holocaust. The burnt offering in the Hebrew, it's a holocaust. Jesus' death on the cross was what? A holocaust, a burnt offering. And now in exchange, he's saying, the exchange life policy, I've given my life as a burnt offering, as a sacrifice, as a holocaust for you, and now I'm simply asking you to give yours to me. Is he asking you to die? Not in a physical sense, is he? He's asking you to live. But he's asking you to live in him. Because it's your reasonable act of service. That's word service here. It's referring to a divine service. It's referring to an act of worship. It is the only sane and reasonable and sensible thing for a believer if they really understand all that they have in Christ is to offer themselves as that birth offering. Do you know what the savings rate is in the United States? You know, you know what percentage of people in the United States have zero savings? 50%. That's right, right? 50%. 50% of the people in the United States have zero savings. Now, if that's us in this land of prosperity, right, and blessing, and we're so affluent, what about the rest of the world? So much of the rest of the world spends their entire day just trying to accumulate enough material or food provision just to, to feed themselves one meal a day. The majority, the majority of the world eats one meal a day. We have to work hard to do that, don't we? <laughs> I don't know about you, but... You know. How much are you sacrificing when he has given so much? Now, I'm not asking you to eat one meal a day, but I'm, I'm asking you, what are you truly living for? Are you really sacrificing your life, exhausting your life, spending your life, your time, your resources on things that benefit the kingdom and God in your divine act of worship, service? Or it's just the accumulation of what you want in life? Those things, those pleasures. It may be completely legitimate for the unbeliever to exhaust and spend his life on their desires, on their pleasures, on their wants. It's totally unacceptable for us as believers to do the same. Isn't that true? Do I hear an amen? amen. Well, a couple of people got it. You know. Back to chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy, oh, no, only can be done by the mercies of God. You understand that, right? I have to pray and ask God to put that within me, to be able to sacrifice myself that way. I, I can't do it, right? What does Philippians tell us? It is God who works within us both to will and to do. Why? Because I don't have the desire, nor do I have the ability unless God gives it. And that's a merciful, right? That God would give me that desire. Now, how does that happen? Delight yourself in the Lord. And what? He gives you the desires of your heart. When you delight yourself in the Lord, all you want to do is live for him. And then he fulfills those desires in your heart. He allows you, gives you the ability, the desire and the ability to live for him, to do exactly what Paul's admonition is here in chapter 12 and verse 1. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Yes, conformity, that's what they want, right? Sameness, right? Hmm. We're not talking the, the equity nonsense that's going on today, right? No. Don't be conformed to this world. And don't be to conform to the ideologies of this world. So many, even within the church, professing Christians are so brainwashed in the ideology of today. The wokeness. If you believe that the Bible is literally the word of God and should be taken literally, raise your hand. That's a good percentage. Do you know what percentage of the church today? This is the la latest poll. What percentage of the church today, those who profess to be Christian, believe that the Bible is literally the word of God and should be taken literally? You know what percentage is? 
20 percent. Lowest percentage ever. 20 percent. We, we, have, oh, we have a myriad, beloved, of make-believers, not true believers. They're make-believers, okay? We have a myriad of, not pastors, imposters. <laughs> Levi shared that with me yesterday in the men's study. We were talking about these pastors who aren't truly acting as pastors. He said, well, they're not pastors, Pastor Rick. They're imposters. Oh, that's good. I like that. Not pastors, imposters. <laughs> you do understand the difference, I hope. And the best of men are men at best. That's all we are. Hey, when God wanted to speak to Balaam, who did he use? Yeah, jackass, yeah. And, and God uses jackasses all over the country every Sunday morning to speak to his people. Yeehaw. That's all we are. Now, it's okay for me to say it. It's not okay for you to say it. <laughs> right? But it's true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't agree with me. Be transformed. And that Greek word for transformation, metamorpho, metamorpho, where we get the English word? Metamorphosis. And, and the only metamorphosis that really takes place that's such an example of this in nature is, is when this, this ugly creature with all those legs, you know, just crawls around. You know, what kind of an existence do they have? You know, they, they look up from the ground, maybe, you know, a, a quarter of an inch, an eighth of an inch, you know, and climb up some tree and eat lettuce every day. <laughs> lettuce. Uh, every day. Oh, but one day, one day it cocoons, and it dies to self. It no longer exists. It reaches a vanishing point. We don't see it any longer. And then one day, something absolutely wondrous, marvelous, miraculous takes place. It breaks forth, and it becomes this beautiful monarch butterfly. Whew. Wait till you see me then. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Now, that's what he's talking about. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that beauty we should be displaying. I've got to hurry here. Verse 3, For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly as he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So what should we be? Humble, Right? We should, we should live a humble life. We should esteem others higher than our own selves. And it's very important that we not be prideful. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, right? And that's what he's referring to here. For as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, but we, being many, are one body in Christ, individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Let us then use them if prophecy. Let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. This word prophecy or prophetia, what he's referring to there is not the foretelling of the future. What is he talking about? The foretelling of the word of God. That's the word here. It's not the foretelling of the future. It's the foretelling of the word of God. And so if you have a gift to share God's word, you should use it. But every one of us have a gift, and the gifts are all differing one to another so that the body functions as it should, right? We have many members in our body. Is that true? Yeah, but all of the, all of the members of the body, every single cell in my body lives for the sake of the whole rest of the body, doesn't it? It, it lives, it sacrifices itself to live for the health of the whole rest of my body. Now, when you have a cell that's living for itself and it's consuming the other cells of the body, what do we call that? Cancer. Cancer. And oh, by the way, uh, Todd and Lisa wanted to thank you so much for your, your prayers for them. Lisa has gone through her surgery and she's recovering and everything seems to be going very well and it appears that uh, hopefully they've gotten it all. But they thank you very much for your love and your prayers and, and the many acts of, of kindness that you've shown them as she had her surgery last week. But when a cell lives for itself, we call it cancer. Same thing is true when a Christian lives for itself. You know, marriage is a wonderful institution, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And when you have two givers in a marriage, it's heaven on earth, isn't it? Because you're, you're both living for the sake of the other one, right? You're just it's giving. How much can I give? How many, I'm going I'm to give more. I'm going to give more. I'm going to give. I love you. I love you more. I love you more. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. You know? And it's a wonderful thing, you know? Now, now, if you have a giver and a taker, well, that's okay. It's just not the ideal, right? But it'll work. So what happens if you have two takers? It's called divorce. 
No, it's called divorce. 54% of the marriages in the church end up in divorce. Why? We got too many takers, not enough givers, right? Marriage is all about giving, right, Ray? Right, Pam? Yeah, it's a, marriage is meant to be life-giving, an institution where, where life is given one to another. It's a beautiful thing, right? That's what he's talking about here. You have many members, but all differing in our gifts, but all working together. I don't have it all. You don't have it all, right? But all together, we have, we have it all, right? Nobody has it all together, but all together, we have it all. That's the whole point he's making here, unity. The unity that we should have in the body of Christ. And when you really are allowing Christ to live his life through you, Christ prayed that we would be one, one with the Father, one with him, one with another. And then his prayer is being realized as we display true Christian unity. And, and recognizing and celebrating our different gifts and talents. You know, I, 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 I wish, I wish I had the heart that Gail's got. And sometimes she might think she wants the head I've got, but you really don't, believe me. You don't want to be inside this head. <laughs> but I so, I so appreciate the heart my Jesus has given his daughter, her love and her compassion, her, jo her joy. I mean, she, she finds joy just getting up in the morning. I don't know how to understand that. You know. He who ministers, let him use it to ministering. He who teaches and teaching, he who exhorts and exhortation, he who gives with liberty, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, from nurse, verse 9 to verse 21, he's going to talk about the attributes of the life of Christ being lived out in a Christian. If we are truly going to reach the vanishing point, we're going to die to ourselves and live for the Lord, this is what it's going to look like. Now, I encourage you to go through this list regularly. <coughs> Actually, there's a devotional that I picked up several years ago. A friend of Gail sent it to us, and we've read through it a number of times now. It's called Learning to Love in 27 Days by Norman R. Wise. He's a wise guy. Norman, write it down. Norman R. Wise, Learning to Love in 27 Days. It's good for an individual. You can read that individually, and, and, and it's a number of the aspects of the love of Christ that should be displayed in our lives. It's wonderful for couples to read together. Not for the sake of pointing the finger at one another, right? But for the sake of allowing the Holy Spirit to search you and be able to change you from the inside out. I've told you so many times before, I don't read the Bible. What do I do? The Bible reads me. I don't read the Bible. The Bible reads me. It tells me more about myself than I want to know. Isn't that true? Yeah. So let's look at these aspects of love, Christian love, and how we should behave if we truly are living in Christ or being Christ-like. First of all, let love be without hypocrisy, meaning sincere. Our love should be sincere. Well, you know, we, we love not for what we can get out of the relationship. We love for what we can put into the relationship, right? Right? But so often, our love is a selfish love. What can I get out of it? What's in it for me? Well, that's a fleshly, carnal way of looking at love. That's not true love. True marital love will exist and flourish when both people are truly loving one another to see how much they can give in the relationship rather than what they can get. Isn't that true? And so your love needs to be sincere. It needs to be, it needs to be from the heart, truly. Hmm? Abhor... What is evil? I asked you, I think it was last week, to ask the Holy Spirit, what is it about your life that you find acceptable that the Holy Spirit would find detestable? It's a reasonable question for every one of us to ask the Holy Spirit because there are things that we allow into our life that we compromises or accommodations or appeasements that we make that shouldn't be there and are hindering our walk with the Lord. And you need to confess them. We're all a work in process. When is this work going to be finished? When we're out of here. When, when the day we die. But until then, God is continually asking to take up residence in my heart in every single area of my life without exception. And he's constantly showing me those areas where I haven't allowed him entrance. Where I put on the door, do not enter. You know what I'm talking about. When you take the signs down, you'd open that door and let him come in and let him make you the new creation 
that he's called you to be. Hmm? Yes, abhor what is evil. But then stick like glue to what? <laughs> Cling to what is good. And that's what the word here in the, in the Greek text for clinging, it's sticking. It's like glue. I mean, it's just, you're, it's just super glue. You're going to be super glued to that which is good. And it's so important. Yeah, if there's anything about your life that enjoys any area of darkness, you need to let the light in. When you let the light in, what happens to the darkness? It flees. And then you stick to the good. In our closest associations, those of you who, who are single or whether you're married, in those closest intimate relationships, and their closest associations, you want to make sure that the people you're running with, they're good. They're pursuing the good. They're Christ-like. They're God-honoring. Micah, bad company corrupts good character. How often? Always. That's what the Bible says, Micah. And because it's in the Bible, it's true. Not true because it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible because it is true, right? And bad company corrupts good character. How often, Henry? Always. Oh, and remember that. So you want to make sure you're keeping good company. Cling, stick to what is good people, virtues. You know, there's not much we have control over, is there? No. But what you do have control over is your thoughts, your choices, your actions. Your thoughts and the decisions you make and the actions that follow. That's what you have control over. You've got to make sure it's righteous, it's good, it pleases God. Enoch reached the vanishing point. Why? Because it pleased God. And he was no more. Be kindly affectionate to one another. And this word, phileo stargos, phileo stargos, is a family love. Uh, we're in the family of God. Whether you like it or not, I'm your brother. Whether you like it or not, you're, gonna, you're stuck with me forever, okay? But I like it, and I'm stuck with you, right? As a family, we should love one another the way we should with a family love. As children love their parents, parents love their children, sisters love their brothers, brothers love their sisters, etc., etc. That's what he's talking about here. Are you kindly affectionate? I, listen, my flesh is biased. Is yours? You know, I love everybody in Christ. I love everybody. But what, what's the reality? There's some people I there's some people I like more. Now, why is that? Because of my fleshly bias. Now, I have to get beyond that. I have to, I have to put that aside. You know, and, and, and you, you know, if you're not Italian, I mean, I don't know what, you know, what, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we all have a fleshly bias, and, and we have to put that bias aside. And, and we have to go beyond what, what our fleshly bias are and truly love one another. Now, if you're having trouble with somebody, what should you do? Pray for that person. Listen, if you're having trouble, and you don't know why, you know, it's just, it's just you, it's your flesh, okay? And it happens to me, okay? I, you know, whatever, I just, you know, I, I just don't click with it. I just don't resonate. I mean, just, you know. Well, if I start praying for that person, all of a sudden, God starts changing my heart. So I know you don't click with me. I know I don't resonate with you, but just start praying for me. You start praying for me, you're going to love me. Guaranteed, you know? That's what he's talking about here. A kindly affectionate one to another where, where we just we love everyone with Christ's love. And brotherly love. This is a fraternal love. You know, the, the bond that we have as brothers and, and sisters, right? Know, know how good and how pleasant it is. What? When brethren dwell together in unity, in honor, giving preference to one another. Yeah, meaning you put others first. Meaning, you, you lead the way for them. You help them. You make, you make life easy for them. You, you prefer them. When you, when you go into the uh, pavilion and all of those delicious foods are out there, and if you want to be the first in line, that's not giving preference to others. Now, you know what's going to happen. The next time we have that, everybody's going to be standing around. <laughs> right? But, but that's the kind of thing they're talking about. Putting others first instead of yourself. Hmm? Not lagging in diligence. What does that mean? Don't be slothful. Consider the ant, oh, you sluggard, right? <laughs> we should be industrious, you know? God, listen, God created us to worship him, but God created us to work, right? He created us to work. God is a creative God, and he expects us to be creative. He expects us to work, and... You, 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 
Laziness, slothfulness, that's a sinful thing. You know, nothing would ever get accomplished if everyone just sat on their hands waiting for somebody else to do it. And is that what happens when, when we get together as a communion, as a community, and we have some work to do? Are you jumping in and helping us with the work, or are you just waiting for everybody else to do it? You know, that's what he's talking about here. But now he's, he's talking about the work of Christ, serving the Lord. He's going to say that in a moment. Look what he says. Being diligent, not lagging in diligence, being fervent in spirit. What does that mean, fervent in spirit? Hot. Hot. Boiling. The, the word here in the Greek text means boiling, boiling over for God. Are you boiling over for God, fervent for the Spirit? And what it really means is you desire. And so, Today's my free day. You know what I get to have today? Ice cream. ice cream. I love ice cream. I could eat ice cream every day, but boy, I'd pay for it, wouldn't I? You know? <laughs> more ways than one. But, but I, I, I desire ice cream, but you know what I desire more? The work of God's Spirit in my life. I want to see God work in me, first and foremost in this relationship, to bring health to her, to love her, to care for her, to keep her, right? And one another. That's what it means, fervently desiring the work of the Spirit in your life. You, you know those things. Now, yesterday, we were, we, were, we were down at, uh, how many have been to Unity Park, the new Unity Park? It's beautiful down there, beautiful. I mean, Gail and I, we cycle a lot, and so we'll cycle up to the Swamp Rabbit. And yesterday, we took Snickers. Now, some of you have the wrong impression about Snickers because I showed someone a picture of Snickers the other day, and they think I got this little lap dog. And I don't have a little lap dog. Snickers is not a lap dog, okay? Snickers is the smallest dog I've ever owned, but he's about 65 pounds. He's a, a Dutch shepherd. Yeah, now he's six, so he's on a diet too. You know, everybody in the house is on a diet. <laughs> boy, boy, are we going to eat when we go to heaven? I'm telling you. Marriage feast of the Lamb. Taste and see is the Lord not good. <laughs> but anyway, we took Snickers down to Unity Park to walk around the park. And, and you know, uh, you dogs do stuff, right? You know, they, they, you know, all dogs have an Egyptian background. They like to stop and make pyramids. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And so he, he stopped and he made a pyramid. And we didn't have a, we didn't have a bag to pick it up with. And Gail, Gail always has the bag. You know, you're the bag lady, right? Yeah. And then, you know, and, and she, there's no way she would have left it there. My wife, and she just wouldn't have done that. She'd find a bag and she'd go back, we'll trace our step, she'll pick it up. Well, this other couple was walking by and this guy made a remark. Yeah, he was not happy. He was not, No. no. And, and, you know, instantly, what do you think happened to me? <laughs> the Hulk, you know. No. I, I didn't say a word. I wanted to. I didn't say a word. After a few minutes, I said to Gail, I was the Lord. I was the Lord. You know, I love it when the Lord shows up, you know, fervent in spirit. You know, that's the kind of, I know that never happens to you all. You're, you got it conquered. And she went back and picked up the poop. You know? That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. Serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. Now, now listen to me. All right, how many of you have children in uh, our fellowship, being ministered to by our fellowship? Have you, you have, okay, so good. You're all serving, right? Serving the Lord, you know? Now, now listen, if, 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 if you're bringing your kids and you're dropping them off and we're taking care of them or we're, we're watching your babies in the nursery and you're not serving, hmm, that's pretty selfish. You'll let somebody else do it, but you don't want to do it. Why is it, you know, anybody have a bulletin? Why, why is it every week, thank you, Anthony, every week in the bulletin, now again, I'm not trying to condemn anybody, am I? I'm not trying to judge anybody, am I? I'm not trying to step on your toes, am I? What am I trying to do? Touch your heart. Why is it every week, every week in the bulletin, we're asking for volunteers for the nursery and the children's ministry? when we're serving the Lord. Because we don't. We like to serve self. We like other people to serve the Lord so they can serve me, right? 
Now, you get my point? The, my prayer is that the Lord will work within you, give you the desire and the ability, so that you so desire one to work with the babies and our children that we won't have this in the bulletin anymore. We'll have, to, we'll, we'll have to be like Moses. You know when Moses asked for the offering to build the tabernacle? What happened? He had to tell people, stop giving. Stop, stop, stop. We got too much. We got too much. So I, I, I hope and pray. One day, we're going to put in the bulletin, we've got way too many nursery workers and Sunday school workers. You need to go do something else. We, we have other things for you to do. But you don't need to watch the babies. You don't need to teach the children. But if you have children in the ministry here and you're not serving, talk to God about it. And I'm going to pray he talks to you about it. <laughs> serving the Lord. There's a number of capacities in which we serve the Lord, but the only, the, listen to me. You were, I was hungry and you fed me. I was sick and you ministered to me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was naked and you clothed me. What did they say to him? When did we do these things, Lord? And what did he say? If you've done that unto the least, my, my church, my people, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Serving the Lord, truly serving the Lord, is when we serve the body of Christ, serve one another. That's what he's talking about. All members have different gifts, but all together we work for the service and the sake of the body as a whole. Hmm. We're so used to throwing a few dollars at something rather than giving of ourselves. Isn't that true as Americans? Yeah. My son is in Ukraine this morning. Flew there Friday. And he's serving the Lord in Ukraine. And so I'm praying for him, but I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased that he would desire to risk some of its comforts and even the dangerous situation that they're in over there to go and serve the Lord there in Ukraine, to serve the body of Christ, those Ukrainian people. And so you have to ask yourself the question, every single one of you ask this, are you serving the Lord or are you self-serving? Is, is it about you and what you desire to do and how you want to promote yourself and your name, or is it really about Christ and wanting to minister on behalf of Christ? I'm going to go through the rest of this list pretty quickly, but I strongly encourage you, please, these 27 attributes of the love of Christ that should be displayed in and through our lives, we need to look at this continually. Learning to love in 27 days, Norman R. Wise. I strongly encourage you to get it. It's a quick read. It's a daily devotional for 27 days. You'll really enjoy it. Rejoicing in hope. Yeah. Who was the apostle of hope? Pietro. Peter. Peter was the apostle of hope, right? John's the apostle of love. Paul, apostle of faith. Peter constantly, constantly reminding us, encouraging us in this blessed hope that we have. It's not a maybe, right? The hope of the Bible is an absolute assurance of something that's coming, a certainty. Hmm. Yes, rejoicing in hope. What did, we, what did we talk about early on in the message? What are we hoping for? Come, Lord Jesus, come. He's coming. You do believe that, don't you? He's definitely coming again. Now, it may be tomorrow. It may be this September. It may be next year. It may be 10 years. It may be 100 years. But he is coming. It's a definite. And that's our blessed hope for all of us. <coughs> Patient in tribulations. Hupomone is the word there in the Hebrew when we talk about being patient. What, what, what is that perseverance? The hupone? It means when you're under a testing or a trial or a situation or a suffering that God has, God has purposed for you and all things are from God, aren't they? For all things work together for good. Now, you don't cut and run underneath or run out from under what God is bringing you through because those sufferings, those trials, those tribulations, the only purpose is to know the fellowship of his suffering. Why? Because it's going to perfect and mature me. The, the great physician has a suffering prescribed for every one of us. And so, sometimes there's a multitude of sufferings we go through. Why? Because we need to be perfected. Paul was perfected in his grace, in his Christ-likeness, through the multitude of the sufferings he went through. Nothing will humble us more, right, than tribulation, suffering, trials. Hmm. Patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Why is it the, the, the prayer service is the least attended service? You know? Have a potluck or a day on the lake? 
Everybody shows up. <laughs> right? It's true. It's true. You know, but have a, have a prayer service. When do we meet for prayer corporately? The third Sunday of the month. Where were you? <laughs> All right, so I, I, I assume you weren't here, but you were praying anyway. I'll assume that. But we need to be people like my friend Reptevia, you know? Fiddler on the roof. How many seen Fiddler on the roof? Okay? What was characteristic of Reptevia? Constantly talking to God, constantly aware of God's presence in his life. Everything he's doing, no matter what it was, he's talking to God. He's in prayer. He's communicating. That's all it is. Constantly in prayer, communicating to God, bringing God into every situation, every concern, every praise, every rejoicing, every sorrow referring to here, steadfast in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. We're helping to meet the needs of people, right? And particularly in the body. I can't tell you how many calls I get every week. Every week somebody is, is steeple chasers. You know what a steeple chaser is? It's somebody who goes through the phone book calling churches, because churches have steeples, you know, most churches, right? But, but we lost that tradition, haven't we? Do you, do you know in years gone by, in the United States of America, you could not build a building taller than the church steeple. Did you know that? How many didn't know that? The rest of you don't want to admit it. You couldn't build a building higher than the church steeple. Why? Because no matter where you were in the town or the village, if you were in trouble, you just look to the skyline and look for the steeple, and you make your beeline to the church, to where the help really comes from. The help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, right? And so... I have people every week that call me because they're steeple chasers. They go through the phone book and they just start calling churches. And what do they want? Money. Money. And you know the first question I ask them? Well, give me the name of your former church and your pastor. I want to call them. Just get a reference. Click. 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 Now, I, I, listen, it's not, not that I'm trying to be rude, but if we tried to meet every need that's out there, we would exhaust everything we have in a day. You understand that? In a day. Now, God has the ability, but he doesn't. And why? Because he expects people to take responsibility for their actions and the consequence of their choices, the results. And we help the body of Christ. Believe me, the body of Christ that is here. So I tell them, you know, do I know you? Oh, yeah, my, my children go to the Sunday school. This one fellow is calling me up. He says, yeah, my children go to the Sunday school. I said, really? I know every child by name. Who are they? You know, we're a small church. We're not like a mega church. They can get away with that in a mega church. You know, can't get away with it here. Right? Steeple chasers. But should we be meeting the needs of one another in the body? Yes. Absolutely. Now, now, as the days get a little darker, then there may come a greater opportunity for us to really meet the needs of the saints. To meet one another's needs as a body. Hmm? <clears throat> Hospitality, what is that? Inviting the pastor and his wife over for ice cream. <laughs> no, no, no. Hospitality, opening up your heart, opening up your home. You know, there, there's no better way to get to know somebody when your knees are all under the same table. Table fellowship, breaking bread together. Jesus was into that all the time, wasn't he? You know, what did he leave us behind to remember him by? Food and drink, right? Wine and bread, right? Jesus, would, when, when Jesus was resurrected and they didn't recognize him, what did he say? Give me some food. Watch me. You'll know it's me. You know? <laughs> Fellowship, hospitality. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And you never get to know anybody better when you have table fellowship. You share. And work. Right, Ray? Ray and I were working yesterday, and we both agreed. You know, you want to get to know me? If I want to uh, work with me. If I want to get to know you, I'll work with you. Now, some people think, even in our little church, that we're cliquish. We're not cliquish. Work with us. Get involved. Get involved in the ministry. Serve somewhere, and you'll get to know all of us, right? I have a lot of people, they want to, they, well, Pastor Ritt, will you spend some time with me? Do this? Yeah, I'll, come work with me. I'll spend time with you. Work with me, right? I, I don't have time for just social relationships. There's so much work to be done. Isn't that true? But if you work with me, you'll get to know me. And you want to know the body of Christ here? You work with them. Work with everyone. We're a small body, but we still need a lot of help, don't we? Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Those two things there. Bless those who persecute you. That's a hard thing to do sometimes, isn't it? 
but it's very Christ-like. What did he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Who's the first Christian that was martyred? Stephen. Stephen. And what did he say? Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. And so when we really are allowing the, Christ, the life of Christ to live himself through us, when people persecute us, say, all men of evil against us, we pray for them. Father, forgive them. They're doing it in their ignorance. They don't know any better. And bless, bless, do not curse. You know, I'd like to see some of these leaders that we have today who seem to be more demonically inspired than they are spiritually. I'd like to see them all get saved. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Yes. Hmm? If we have a revival meetings in Washington, all of Washington, D.C. gets saved. Can you imagine such a thing? Wow. <laughs> How about the Chinese? What, what, what a miracle that would be if the Chinese, you know, the Chinese house church is exploding, you know, but the Chinese government, the CCP, you know, China Communist Party has got complete and total control, like an iron fist. But can you imagine if Xi Jinping and the rest of the CCP eh, end up receiving Christ? What an amazing thing that would be. Hmm? Yes, blessed, do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. We share in the rejoicing and we share in the suffering. You know, Americans love success, don't you? We love success. We just hate successful people. We're jealous. <laughs> Is that not true of a lot of people? Yeah, they get envious and jealous over successful people, but we, we should rejoice when good happens to our brothers, right? And, and we should weep and grieve when they're in sorrow. It's a wonderful thing to grieve with one another, you know. And, and sometimes the best way to display your sharing of grief is simply just your presence. Don't say a word, just be with them. You know, in my deepest times of sorrow and grief, what blessed me the most were the brothers who would just, just, just be there, just sit with me, and not to say a word. Not, and, and the last thing you want to do is just start spouting off scripture verses, because I know them. But, but that doesn't help my broken heart, right? But your presence, what ministers to the broken hearted? The presence of Jesus. Only Jesus in his presence can heal the broken heart, and he'll use us as ministers of presence, the ministry of presence in the lives of those who are grieving. And rejoice with those who rejoice. Be of the same mind towards one another. How do you acquire that? Through the study of the Word of God. It's already 12, it's quarter to 12. Hmm. All right, we'll finish this next week. I won't keep you because you won't pay attention after a little while because the, the mind can only receive what the seat can endure, right? And your seat's about ready to go, huh? Shall we stand?